So let's take a look at the, um, the Japanese vernacular architecture. Um, Japanese architecture also use wood um, as the major material. And um, <clears throat> they use post and lintel rectangular timber construction employing dry joinery, which means the you know, you do not use glue. You just use mortise and tenon making those, um, those joint. And some of those joint making is quite, quite amazing, um, quite ingenious. Um, the, just using wooden pen and using, um, using the holes and the tongues in the members to create very um, strong, joint. And um, their construction using column supporting um, beams and purlins and then rafters for a roof. So this kind of post and lintel construction, right? And uh, the wooden frame create a, a framed structure and uh, the walls are usually just divided by the sliding doors and the panels, those are movable and adjustable. So the interior space can be combined flexibly by pushing the wall in, by pushing the screen into a wall to create a bigger space or pull it out to divide the space into smaller rooms. It's that kind of flexible. Um, interior division. Unlike Chinese architecture, most Japanese residential architecture has elevated floor and the um, could be heated underneath. And um, so um, instead of, um, you know, directly using the masonry pavement, um, the use more wooden floor um, elevated from the ground. Um, so Japanese architecture has a great sense of openness because those panels can be removed, can be lifted up to make complete uh, connection between interior and e exterior. And during summer, they can also be removed uh, to allow the breeze to pass the interior space. I mentioned that the heartland of Japanese civilization is in the southern area, which is uh, pretty warm, never uh, too harsh in winter. So this kind of a flexibility allows them to cope with different temperature in different season. And um, so their architecture is more summer oriented. Um, and there is absolutely no use of massive wall, um, except for the castle architecture. And there's no thermal barrier, no waterproof windows. Walls are those movable, paper thin partitions, um, you know, those screens um, with rice paper covering to allow the light to enter the interior, even when the, um, the doors are closed. The Japanese also um, made clear differentiation between floor, uh, earth floor and uh, wooden floor. So there is a wood raised wooden floor, like in this interior, and there is um, earth floor. So uh, shoes were meant to be removed before one ascend to the elevated uh, wooden floor. Right. So you, when you visit those traditional Japanese architecture, there is always a place where you put your shoes um, before you go to the area for um, formal activities like this. And um, 
the modul modularity of Japanese architecture is in the two dimensional tatami, right? So a tatami refer to the mat to cover the floor. And that tatami is roughly uh, one by two meter, small, let's slightly smaller than that, but roughly one by two meter, that, that scale. And the, the floor area is referred to by the number of tatami. So you can say, you know, you, you have a room of four tatami, which is relatively small, um, or if you have eight uh, tatami room, that is a big room. So the, 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 um, the talk about the size of their house, of their room, uh, in terms of numbers of tatami. So that's a module of the Japanese floor. Um, so here it shows how those tatami can be arranged to cover a space. They were usually arranged to suppress symmetry to create an asymmetrical, quite dynamic uh, interior feeling. And then um, the wall is like the vertical tatami. Um, the walls known as the shoji um, provide the module for the vertical plane of an architecture. Um, those uh, movable screen are known as the fusuma and uh, fixed are known as shoji. So Japanese house is not made of cells and rooms um, very different from the Chinese, you know, bay division in Chinese architecture. In Japanese architecture, the interior is has a feeling of all connected. And then you can divide, flex, divide them flexibly uh, using those, those fusuma, movable um, vertical divisions. And uh, Japanese architecture, um, their vernacular architecture also share the same feeling and aesthetic preference as the Shinto Shuan, like what we um, have looked at, the Ise Shuan. In that natural material, the color and the texture of natural material are emphasized, right? So there is a great sense of naturalness in the appreciation of the grains in the wood and uh, those um, unpolished surface of those wooden members also reveal the natural material of the roof and the ceiling. Didn't um, pursue kind of a uniformity um, in the way those, you know, rafters and purlins are shaped. So there is a great sense of naturalness. And, um, and these aesthetic preference is also reflected in the um, Japanese Zen architecture. Well, the Zen is also like Pure Land is also a Chinese created Buddhist school, but it had great influence on Japanese architecture. Introduced into um, Japan during the Kamakura period became really popular uh, during the uh, following uh, Muromachi, Momoyama, and uh, Edo period. So basically, you know, after the 14th century, um, the Japanese art highlight the Zen feeling. So what is the Zen feeling? There are some, there are certainly some Zen standard that coincide with the Shinto preference about simplicity, about naturalness. So Zen also highlight simplicity, highlight um, the seemingly um, simple and uh, undecorated poor quality, but actually there is a deeper meaning in, in that preference, right? 
So there are sp specific terms referring to the Zen taste, like a wabi, sabi, and shibui. So, um, so I have those kind of definition put here. But in general, they emphasize something that is seemingly poor quality, but in, in reality, that seemingly poor quality is a, um, is a deliberate achievement. Uh, it's a, something looks simple, but that simplicity was deliberately achieved by some kind of effort. They all highlight that. They also appreciate those um, seemingly imperfect, not perfect quality. So the surface is not meant to be um, in uniform or in the same color, perfect smoothness. That is not part of the Zen uh, wabi-sabi preference, right? Kind of, kind of comparable to, um, you know, some girls like to wear jeans with holes, right? So it's not like you cannot afford a perfect uh, trousers. Those holes um, are deliberate, deliberately made. It looks kind of a poor quality, but you know, you, you like it. You, you, you specifically want that. So that's the that's to some extent the Zen is looking to the same same thing, uh, seemingly imperfect, but that kind of a imperfection is perfect. It's perfectly imperfect. So that's kind of a Zen um, feeling. And uh, the Zen famous Zen garden is created following that aesthetic preference of wabi, sabi, and shibui. This is the famous garden of Liuanji temple and the Liuanji is a um, Zen temple. So these Zen garden is very small in scale. They are attached to the residence of the abbot of the monastery. Um, these Zen garden are known as Kale Sansui. Uh, Kale Sansui. Kale means dry, bare, withered. Sansui means landscape. Uh, literally, it's mountain and water. So it's dry landscape. Why is it called dry landscape? You know, landscape in the East Asian um, definition needed to have mountain and a river or lake, water surface. But here, just a few rock was put there to represent a mountain and uh, some raked surface of sand represent water. So it's dry, there's no real water. It's just uh, the patterns on the sand to mimic water. It's called dry landscape. Um, a, a unique feature of Zen garden is that you are not meant to enter. You are just meant to sit on the side to meditate upon it and to appreciate it. Uh, so it's, it's not meant to be entered. It's small in scale, but the walls are diminished in scale to allow you to imagine a full landscape by focusing or your attention to these rocks and raked sand. And the walls were also deliberately made dirty, seems old, um, and also allow someone to imagine a atmospheric background to picture a grand landscape in one's vision, right? So it's not uni uniform in, in, in in color and texture, it is certainly not meant to be appreciated as new. And, um, and all those fit into uh, the Zen preference about wabi and sabi. 
Um, the Zen priest Tessen Soki claimed that Liuanji manifest the art of reducing 30,000 miles to the distance of a single foot. It, same thing can be said about Chinese landscape painting. And um, it strips nature into its bare element and correspond with the Zen asceticism and purity. And uh, Zen garden was not meant to be entered. It is meant to be meditated upon. So it's an instrument for meditation. It reveals the thinness of representation while manifesting the Zen concept that at the heart of the thing is a void. And um, so, um, and that is, you know, the, um, the simplicity, the seemingly simplicity is, can only be understood while you look into um, the rich background of Zen tradition. And um, at the heart of the Zen tradition is a mistrust of language and uh, representation as a way to communicate, to communicate truth. And indeed, the Zen teaching of Buddhism is very eccentric. Um, and their architecture certainly reflect this. Instead of worshiping a statue of a Buddha, the Zen claim that the true Buddhahood is not in the statue or the image of Buddha, but something else. And to some extent, they also claim everything is Buddha nature. And that is the heart, at the heart of, the, um, of Zen. And they also uh, try to communicate a very truthful information that um, very often verbal communication, textual communication, imagery communication are misleading. And uh, that part of the understanding of reality and the nature is um, is very true, um, and we we find that you know every now and then in our real life we find a Zen moment that we find silence is is better than speaking a lot of words that very often lead to misunderstanding rather than you know helping for understanding, and in that sense you know. Um, Zen is certainly worth, you know, looking into and try to figure out what they were trying to say behind their very eccentric way of, you know, spreading uh, Buddhism. So it's a kind of a unique school of Buddhism, but uh, very powerful. So I think to um, with that, you know, I maybe I shouldn't say too much worse. Um, and if you are interested, you can certainly find more reading about about Zen. There are plenty of them, and uh, there this is their architectural product that represent Zen, a Buddhist school without the representation of Buddha at all, and that is considered most most Buddh Buddhist in the Zen tradition.